Thank you. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, I'm Robert Holliman, and I'm President and CEO of BSA, the Software Alliance. So on, and on behalf of all of our members, thank you uh, for coming to be part of this important discussion. I'd also like to thank our colleagues at the National Association of Manufacturers uh, for co-sponsoring this event with BSA, and a particular thanks to Majority Leader Eric Cantor for hosting us in the Capitol Visitors Center. Our discussion today is about the vital link between software innovation and growth, and it's about the role that patents play in driving innovation. This is a timely discussion because there has been a vigorous debate underway and a substantial amount of activity that we've seen in this area in recent years. It was just a year and a half ago that Congress, after a seven-year review, um, approved the America Invents Act, and it was signed into law by President Obama in November of 2011. But as recently as last week, President Obama said in response to a question about patent reform that our efforts at patent reform only went about halfway to the point where they need to go, in his view. And software patents are certainly getting a lot of attention in the media and elsewhere, in part because of the litigation involving patents, in part because of their importance to the economy. And much of this litigation also involves patent assertion entities, which are often called trolls. And their work underway in the courts. The Federal Court of Appeals is considering what should qualify as a software invention in the case of CLS Bank versus Alice Corp. And at the Patent and Trademark Office, there's a series of ongoing roundtable discussions with industry to ask how the patent system can be improved. And all of this is happening at a time little more than a year after most of the final rulemaking at PTO was done related to the AIA. So there's a huge amount of activity and discussion and news about this, but I hope in today's panel we can really keep three things in mind. One is that patents play an important role in driving software innovation, and that benefits the economy as a whole. Second, there are indeed legitimate issues, such as how to keep improving the quality of patents that are issued. But there's also a lot of noise around this debate. And what we want to do is focus on the real substantive issues where clarity can be gained. And finally, when you do think about these issues, I think it's best that the clear way to address this is by looking at the series of legitimate issues around quality and developing thoughtful solutions to look at many of those. Let me explain what I mean. We live in a software-driven world. Cell phones, cars, medical equipment, thermostats, the energy grid are all dependent on software. And all the things that we take for granted in our daily life. And the software industry alone invests about $50 billion a year in R&D, and those numbers are rising. And the ability to patent software creates a critical incentive for this innovation. Now, 30 years ago, the US Supreme Court ruled in the Diamond versus Deere case that software should be treated the same as any other invention. But there's a vocal group of critics who insist that somehow it's different. I believe that that represents a fundamental misunderstanding of software and a fundamental misunderstanding of patent law, threatening one class of invention as being somehow different from all other inventions is effectively an attack on the fundamental rationale for a patent system. Such an approach, in our view, could undermine technological progress and economic growth and really jeopardize the gains that we've seen through America's leadership in this way, not only in software, but in manufacturing and other industries who rely on software. So we think there's a whole series of practical improvements that we can and should be looking at, things like better training, better resources and guidance for the examiners, improving the clarity of patent claims, developing common industry-wide descriptions for new software-related technologies, and I'm sure that our panelists today can touch upon these and a whole host of other suggestions uh, for how to strengthen our system. 
So I'm delighted that uh, we have such a great panel today. They represent a range of companies who are leaders across industry sectors. Uh, they're Dorian, Dorian Daly, who's the general counsel of Oracle, Brad Smith, who's the general counsel of Microsoft, Neil Abrams, who's the vice president of IBM's software group, David Kahn, who's the C CEO of Covia Labs, and Tom Lang, who's the director of corporate R&D at Procter & Gamble. And to get us started, let me introduce our moderator, Bob Stoll. Bob is a partner in the IP practice group at the law firm of Drinker and & Biddle. And previously, he spent uh, a 34-year career in government, including leading efforts at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office a whole, across a whole host of issues from international to policy to patents, uh, ultimately uh, serving as the U.S. Commissioner for um, Patents. And he was instrumental in both the passage and development of the American Invents Act and much of the follow-on work. And so welcome him um, and delighted to have his perspectives from the private and the public sectors. Bob? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Ro Ro thank you Robert, for uh, hosting this extremely important event. Uh, I want to thank uh, BSA and NAM for getting together to have these discussions. Uh, the issue is uh, very close to my heart as having been the most recent uh, ex-commissioner for patents. Uh, I, I feel very passionate uh, on what the Patent and Trademark Office does, and I would like to set the stage a little bit first so you understand uh, the issue related to software patents at the Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, we do not patent lines of code merely. That is not the subject matter of a patent at the Patent and Trademark Office. We patent processes and apparatus, uh, and those processes and apparatus contain software in them. And they are novel and non-obvious. And those are the standards used at the Patent and Trademark Office to patent subject matter. Now, I, you might ask me, well, how many software patent applications do you get? How many patents are there at the Patent and Trademark Office related to software? That's really not something that's easily ascertainable. That's because they're in every piece of important technology that we use today. They're in, as Robert talked about, cars, in manufacturing, in machines, in telecom, in everywhere. So they're scattered throughout the Patent and Trademark Office and critical to our economy. We lead the world in software issues. And I wish that we would take note of that. Uh, I think it's extremely important. Let me also say I recognize a lot of the issues that I've heard and read about uh, related to software patents, and I think most are curable by providing more resources available to the Patent and Trademark Office. The examiners need more tools, better databases to search, more time, more instruction in technology, more understanding and teaching with respect to enablement and written description, and that would help a large degree. We also need our applicants, the attorneys, to be more clear in their claiming and in their disclosure. And I think that would go a long way to improving software patents and taking care of many of the issues that are talked about in the media today. Now, I am moderating, so I'm not going to spend a lot more time pontificating. Uh, but I really like my old friends who I see in the audience uh, who are working very hard to get good patents out. And that's the way I think we can do so. I'm going to briefly give you uh, a bio for my very distinguished speakers. And then they will speak uh, probably five to seven minutes about their ideas. And then I intend to ask questions, several questions, after which I will open it up to the floor to those who are uh, in Congress, who are working here on the Hill, uh, and, and, and people in the media. Uh, and then if there's time left after that, I will open it up more broadly. So that's how I'd like to proceed. Uh, and let me begin by introducing Ms. Dorian Daly, who serves as Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of Oracle Corporation. Prior to her appointment as General Counsel, Ms. Daly was a Vice President and Associate General Counsel for the company. She began her career at Oracle in 1992 after spending five years with the commercial litigation group of Landles, Ripley, and Diamond in San Francisco. 
Next to her is Brad Smith, and he's Microsoft's general counsel and executive vice president heading legal and corporate affairs. Uh, he uh, is responsible for the company's legal work, its intellectual property portfolio, and patent licensing business, and its government affairs and philanthropic work. He also serves as Microsoft's corporate secretary and its chief compliance officer. Since becoming general counsel in 2002, Brad has overseen numerous negotiations leading to intellectual property agreements with governments around the world and with companies across the IT sector. Before joining Microsoft in 1993, uh, Mr. Smith was a partner at the law firm of Covington and Burling. Next to him is Neil Abrams, Vice President and Assistant General Counsel of IBM Corporation. He has overall responsibility for legal matters involving IBM software business. Prior to this position, he was Vice President of Software Intellectual Property at IBM and has extensive knowledge on legal matters involving software and intellectual property. Next to him is Mr. David E. Kahn, Chief Executive Officer of Covia Labs a successful entrepreneur with passion for solving technology challenges, he founded Covia Labs in 2008 in order to facilitate collaboration amongst first responders in crisis situations. He committed himself to making any and all devices, from cell phones to helicopters, work together simply and seamlessly. He first got a taste for solving communications and workflow issues when he helped restructure the engineering process at ADAC Laboratories. David has also founded two venture capital funded payroll companies, InLeague and PerQuest. Next to him and last on our panel is Thomas J. Lang. He's director of the Corporate Research and Development Modeling and Simulation for Procter & Gamble. He joined Procter & Gamble in May of 1978 as a product technical engineer and has spent 29 years at P&G Career mo modeling and simulating product and production systems, from aerodynamics of roasting peanuts <laughs> to how baby sizes and shapes affect urine leakage in diapers. <laughs> I love that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, your esteemed panelists, and I would like to begin with Ms. Dorian Daly to talk to you about her concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I want to thank uh, BSA and the National Association of Manufacturers for organizing this event and giving uh, us the opportunity to address the importance of strong IP protection for software for our companies, our industry, and our economy. I also want to thank all of you for your engagement. My colleagues and I have had the opportunity and the privilege over the years to work with you on many IP issues, including, including that long road to passage of the America in, in Vents Act. Um, and so as you know, these issues can be very complex and very challenging and frankly at times quite boring, uh, at least in compared with many of the other issues that you have to deal with. Uh, but for uh, software companies like Oracle and Microsoft and IBM and other companies, large and small, these are critically important issues. They're also important issues for all businesses outside of the IT sector and public sector entities and individuals who rely on software and the products and the services that use software. In today's environment, where hundreds of thousands of apps are uh, just a click away on all of our mobile devices. It's pretty easy to see how some could assume that software development <coughs> is easy. I'm here to tell you it's not. It's very hard. It requires highly skilled engineers and incredible investments of time and money. And without that right balance of incentives and protections for this difficult creative work, Individuals and businesses simply won't continue to make the kinds of tremendous investments required to drive innovation and growth in the software sector, a sector that is a leading driver of growth in the U.S. economy. So I'd like to just take a few minutes to highlight the importance of intellectual property protection, including patent protection, for software in the context of Oracle's business. Oracle is the world's largest enterprise software company. Enterprise software is simply that software that 
other businesses and governments use to run their business. Most consumers, like you and me, uh, won't ever own this software, but will use it a lot, probably every day in day-to-day -day activities. Every time we do a bank transaction, when we make an airline reservation, when we want to visit an e-commerce website, these are only a few of the countless day-to-day -day activities that depend on enterprise software. It works behind the scenes, but it's the highly sophisticated, scalable, and secure software that provides the infrastructure for the internet and virtually all business transactions. The complexity and the scope of such software is incredible. Let me give you an example. Consider a software system that manages the supply of raw materials and parts to automotive plants. The software has to ensure that the right materials are at the right place at the right time and in the right quantities, or the production line will slow down or perhaps even stop. The software has to account for thousands of variables, including real-time data from hundreds of suppliers, shipping data, pricing data, even weather and road condition data, and teams of hundreds of engineers will spend years of effort devoted to designing and then constantly improving this mission-critical software. Oracle's enterprise software products span what we call the entire technology stack, from our Solaris and the Linux operating systems at the bottom, to our leading database, middleware, web servers, and then a host of business applications. And these applications cover literally the alphabet soup of business functions. HCM, human capital management. CRM, customer relationship management. ERP, enterprise resource planning. And there are banking, finance, finance, procurement, enterprise, performance management, compliance and risk management applications, and then a host of industry-specific applications in the transportation, communications, utilities, retail, and financial services industries, to name just a few. All of these software products in our suite must be designed and optimized to work independently, bundled together in suites, or with third-party products in a variety of customer IT environments. That's not easy. That's quite difficult. Oracle itself has invested over $4.5 billion in research and development last year alone. It will be over $5 billion this year. And this R&D investment funds not only the development of our commercial products, but also groundbreaking projects through Oracle Labs, often in partnership with leading universities. These figures also don't include the investments that we make in acquiring intellectual property via our acquisition program. Oracle employs approximately 32,000 people in full-time R&D positions, and the vast majority of the rest of our 117,000 employees work in sales, consulting, technical support, and training related to these products. These are the kinds of high-skill, high-wage jobs that we all want to encourage. So given these significant investments and the importance of these products, Oracle relies on the full spectrum of legal protection for our intellectual property, <coughs> patents, copyrights, and trade secrets. We hold approximately 15,000 patents worldwide including more than 12,000 in the United States. And we filed more than 700 patent applications in the United States last year. We'll file more next year as our investment in R&D grows. These patents, along with our software copyrights, are the first line of defense against those who would copy our innovations without our permission and often use them in competition with us. The bulk of Oracle's value as a company is in the intellectual property that our employees create. And we own some nice buildings, we have a lot of computers, but the tangible assets pale in comparison to the value of the intellectual property. And weakening the protections for that property puts our business and our employees and our customers at risk. And it certainly reduces the incentives for further investment in innovation. Now, while the patent system is crucial for software investment and generally serves us well, we acknowledge it's not perfect. Few things in life are. 
The system continues to be abused by these so-called non-practicing entities, NPEs. I hear them also now referred to as patent assertion entities, PAEs. We often just refer to them as trolls. And their business model is pretty familiar to everyone in the technology industry and probably to many of you. They're often shell companies created by lawyers who work on contingency. They don't really make any products or have any employees other than the lawyers. They buy patents in the open market and then look for deep pockets to sue, or alternately look for customers of deep pockets to sue. In the last two years, we've had 287 customers make 391 claims for indemnification related to matters involving 38 different trolls. These uh, companies typically sue without warning and in jurisdictions where it's highly unlikely to get summary judgment, at least early summary judgment, and knowing that it will cost several million dollars to litigate one of these cases, even a small case, they seek and often obtain holdup settlements. Unfortunately, this type of abuse of litigation has not slowed down since the passage of the AIA in 2011. All of Oracle's current cases, patent cases, involve NPEs or trolls. And 95% of all the patent cases in the history of the company have involved NPEs or trolls. This abuse of litigation is very expensive, even for well-funded companies, and it's distracting. It draws financial resources and executive and engineering attention away from the things that are most important to technology companies innovation, and product development. But the solution to this litigation abuse problem is not the elimination or the diminution of software patents. There's no rational case for software exceptionalism in patent law, or in copyright law for that matter. As my grandmother used to say, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We think policymakers should focus their efforts rather in three different areas continuing to improve the quality of patents, software patents. And this has been the aim of the AIA, and there's been a tremendous amount of effort that has gone into uh, ensuring this. Ownership transparency, which is the subject of a proposal by the PTO. And then targeted litigation reforms. I'm sure we'll be talking about all of those, um, but for now, I will pass it over to uh, Brad Smith. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you. Dory and I, I want to say how great it is to be here. Really appreciate BSA and NAM putting this together. It's terrific to be on this panel and certainly to have the opportunity to sit here between Dory and, and, and Neil and between Oracle and IBM. People do like to talk about how software is different. It is different. Actually, most things are different. I think it's interesting to bring a certain breadth of perspective to an issue that I think is incredibly important. I think it's helpful to recall the fact that when Thomas Jefferson, as our first Secretary of State, had the responsibility for issuing the first patents, the third patent that he approved was for an improvement in the candle. And over time, we learned that the candle was different from the steam engine. And the steam engine was different from the combustion engine. And the railroad train was different from the airplane. And radio was different from television and pharmaceutical products are different from information technology. And yet the fact that all of these inventions have come forward and been approved with applications for patents under the same unitary patent system is in many ways a remarkable thing. You know, the Industrial Revolution and the world's patent laws started in the United Kingdom. But as Americans, we were quick to adopt them, and we discovered that we love to file patent applications. It took only 13 years after the adoption of the nation's first patent statute for the US to match the UK on a per capita basis for patent applications, even though we were still a humble, just former colony. And by 1860, three things were happening. Abraham Lincoln was running as a dark horse candidate for president. The United States matched the United Kingdom in population. And that year, 
Americans filed seven times as many patent applications as the entirety of Great Britain and its empire. And the truth is, these incentives for invention have served us remarkably well. Just three years ago, the PTO estimated that over a third of America's GDP comes from IP-intensive industries. And over 60% of the nation's manufactured exports come from these industries as well. And I couldn't agree more with what Dorian said. I see every day the huge virtue and contribution that the patent system brings to the incentives for innovation in information technology, whether these are lines of code that start in software and make a computer do new and sometimes amazing things, or whether it's in, implemented in hardware itself. And so I step back from all of this and I say two things. First, we have a patent system with remarkable strengths. I also recognize every day that we have a patent system that has significant weaknesses as well. We need to preserve these strengths and we need to address these weaknesses and that I think really frames the topic today. I had the chance in 2005 to give a speech here in DC and give one of the first calls among our industry at that time for patent reform. And I don't know that it was a particularly good speech, but I will say this, we knew our history well. Because in 2005, we predicted that based on history, you could expect two things to happen. First, it would probably take about six years, that was the average, for Congress to move forward with patent reform legislation. And second, over the course of those six years, the scope of that legislation would actually narrow because the courts would start to step in and improve the law as well. That was in 2005. A year later, the Supreme Court made an enormously important contribution to the improvement of patent law, in my opinion, when it issued its eBay decision and really refined the standard for seeking injunctive relief. It followed that with its famous KSR decision addressing the obviousness standard. And indeed, it was exactly six years later in 2011 that those of you who work in Congress played such an important role by finalizing the AIA. I think as we look to the future steps that we need to take, it really is important to recognize that this isn't an issue that can be addressed by only one part of the government. In fact, I would say today we need new steps in four different quarters. We'll need new steps by the courts. We'll need new steps by the executive branch, especially as it implements the America Advance Act. We'll need some new steps in Congress, and we need new steps in the private sector as well, because those of us who participate in the patent system, those of us who benefit from it, have not just an opportunity, but I think a responsibility to do our part to advance improvements also. I think our goal ultimately is pretty straightforward. We need to advance a high quality patent system that especially for information technology encourages the responsible licensing of patents and deters abusive litigation. And we'll have a chance I think this morning to talk about some of the issues that that connects us to. Certainly, I believe that there's an opportunity to keep improving quality, to build on the important steps that Congress took in the AIA, to work with the PTO, and for those of us in the private sector, frankly, to do a better job of helping as we draft our patent applications. And there's some very specific issues there worth talking about. We have an opportunity to continue to advance the licensing of patents, because especially in an industry sector, that is so often characterized by so many incremental innovations. It is the licensing of patents that helps drive our entire sector forward. We need greater transparency. The PTO is considering requirements for greater transparency. But I don't think we need to wait. I think those of us in industry can step forward. That's why we as a company are announcing a pledge for transparency 
And we're announcing that by the 1st of April, we will publish on the web all the information that anyone needs to identify all of the patents for which Microsoft is the owner and the real party in interest. And we absolutely need to take new steps to discourage abusive litigation. Personally, I think there is an enormously important step that Congress could take if it were to adopt the loser pays rule so that, as is often the case in other countries, someone who files a patent suit and loses has to pay the reasonable attorney's fees for the victorious party. That would encourage the type of a forethought that people should bring to bear before they walk down the street to the courthouse. But here, too, I think companies can move forward. We've pledged in a single sentence that we will never seek an injunction on any standards essential patent for which we have pledged to make a license available on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. And other companies in our industry have started to do the same thing, but it has not spread throughout the industry as a whole, and it should. Finally, I'll say in conclusion, one thing I've learned in 11 years in this job and lots of experience with the patent system is that it is a system that some days can be quite frustrating and even agonizingly so. But it's also a system that is remarkably resilient. I'll always remember the day when we had a patent case pending before a jury in a trial in Southern California. The jury had been out for over four days, and every day our litigators were telling me, it's great news that they're still deliberating. We think that's going to mean a verdict in our favor. And I'll remember turning the corner in the hallway of my building after walking out of a meeting and turning to one of our lawyers and saying, have we heard yet what happened? And he said, oh, didn't we tell you we got the verdict? I said, no, you didn't. What was it? He said, it's $1.52 billion. And my first question was, did you say a billion? And he said, yes, I did. And I said, I think we just set a record. And he said, yes, we did. <laughs> I walked down the hall to tell our CEO, Steve Ballmer, that he had a record-setting legal department working for him every day. <laughs> it was not a record that we were excited to set. And yet, less than two months later, that verdict was set aside. It doesn't mean that the problems aren't real. We do need to take new steps to address them. We all do. But we also need to ensure that in fixing what's broken, we take great care not to break what's working. Because, because what's working is someday, many days, quite amazing in terms of the impact on our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Bob, fellow panelists, and thank you, audience, uh, for allowing me to speak on this important topic today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you this morning about software innovation and IBM's longstanding role as a leading innovator. IBM is committed to ensuring that our patent system is robust and that the United States economy is strong. We have been the leading assignee of issued patents in the United States for 20 consecutive years and we earn about a billion dollars annually in intellectual property related income. IBM also invests more than six billion dollars a year in research and development and generates about a billion dollars of revenue annually providing products and services. IBM is therefore uniquely positioned to promote a balanced patent system that will benefit patentees, producers, and the public. IBM is an innovation company and innovations are critical to our success. In addition to developing, manufacturing, and delivering information technology, we deliver innovative solutions to IBM clients. These solutions always include software, and that software is integral to the solution. Our clients want an innovation partner who can help them apply and integrate technologies in ways that deliver new and lasting value. IBM is at the forefront of innovation in new products and services, and entirely new business models. Many of our solutions focus on weaving intelligence into the fabric of our clients' processes to help build smarter, 
more efficient and effective businesses and public services. These innovative solutions are complex, included multiple innovators, and incorporate hundreds, if not thousands, of patented inventions, including those implemented in software. New innovations oftentimes require investments of unprecedented size, and patents are necessary to protect these investments. One of our recent innovations is IBM Watson. You may remember that Watson is the IBM supercomputer that won Jeopardy a couple of years ago. Watson is covered by many patents, those that enable cognitive computing, which is computing that has the ability to learn. One of those patents is US Patent 8275803, which was issued in 2012. This patented invention describes a technique that enables a computer to take a question expressed in natural language, understand it in detail, and deliver a precise answer to the question. Another Watson patent is US Patent 8250010, also <coughs> issued last year. This patent relates to algorithms and circuits for efficiently mimicking the learning functions of a brain's synapses. But what does this mean in real life? Well, there's an explosion of data in the financial services sector, millions of trades per minute through the exchanges, thousands of financial articles published every day, and critical insights locked away in footnotes and filings. Individuals and organizations alike need help to find the proverbial needle in the haystack to accelerate and improve evidence-based decision-making, reduce operational costs, and optimize outcomes. IBM is working with numerous financial services institutions to apply Watson's deep context analytics, natural learning processing, decision support, and evidence-based learning. This holds the promise of providing companies with new secure banking services designed around their customers' increasingly digital and mobile lives. For example, IBM and Citigroup announced a partnership last year to help Citigroup analyze customer needs and process financial, economic, and client data to advance and personalize digital banking. Another example where patented inventions, including those implemented in software, are making a difference is the Memphis Police Department. The department has enhanced its crime-fighting techniques by using IBM predictive analytics software to reduce serious crime by more than 30 percent and violent crimes by 15 percent. From commanders to patrol officers, the Memphis Police Department evaluates incident patterns throughout the city and forecasts criminal hotspots to proactively allocate resources and deploy personnel. The result is improved effectiveness and increased public safety. Officers can evaluate incident patterns throughout the city and connect the dots, spot crime trends such as increased car burglaries on a rainy night. These innovations and the investments made to deploy them are protected by patents. They not only make the world a better place and meet our clients' demands, but they also allow us to remain competitive and benefit our shareholders, our employees, and the communities in which we live. We're cognizant of the criticisms of inventions implemented in software, but we caution against heeding calls to eliminate or limit software patents or to treat software differently from other innovative technologies. Discriminating against software will harm innovation in the IT industry and disrupt the advances like those that I've mentioned this morning uh, regarding fighting crime and making banking more convenient and efficient. We must also be mindful that software is increasingly the way innovation is implemented across virtually all industries, not just the software industry. Innovations that are embodied in software are efficiently delivering capabilities today that were not possible even a decade ago. Consider, for example, an invention that manages automotive engine cylinder operation to improve fuel efficiency and reduce environmental impacts. A mechanical implementation might add too much weight and cost, offsetting the improvement and eliminating environmental benefits. Using software-controlled microprocessors, the advance is possible with the resultant efficiency, reliability, and safety, all at reduced cost. To be sure, improvements always can and should be made to the quality of patents, including for inventions implemented in software. IBM has championed increased patent quality for years, 
Indeed, just last week, IBM participated in the Patent and Trademark Office's Software Patent Partnership Roundtable and offered suggestions for improving the quality of software patents. And we will continue to actively work to increase patent quality. Improving patent quality increases certainty and spurs investment and in turn will help our economy grow. Thank you. David? I want to thank RSA and for inviting me to speak and my fellow panelists and you, the audience. Hello, my name is David Kahn and, and I am the CEO of Covia Labs. We're a, we're a small software developer based in the Silicon Valley that has developed a um, highly secure interoperability platform in the alert and respond application to provide command and control and situational awareness for the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, and state and local public safety agencies. Covia Labs has recently started to look at uh, securing critical infrastructure such as the electrical grid, water, and transportation, and believes that someday you will see us more generally providing secure financial transactions in enterprise security. I have founded three companies, including Covia Labs, with two being venture funded, and the third being funded by me and angel investors. I'm not a lawyer, but rather a technologist and a business executive in other words, a Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur. Since Covia Lab was awarded 13 patents so far in the United States and a comprehensive patent in the People's Republic of China and has pending patent applications throughout the world, as you might expect, I believe that software patents are important. Here's why. First, patents, and often the case patent applications, can be a critical tool for software companies to get funded. This is the area that I know well. They provide an important proof point that the technology is real and that it can be defended. Venture capitalists, sophisticated investors, private investors, corporate mergers and acquisition staff all respect the competence of the US Patent and Trademark Office to determine that software is novel and worth providing patent protection, and continue to use its determinations as a reason for investing. Patents are important to start up companies. Second, software development provides some of the most fertile ground for entrepreneurship, because an individual with little more than a PC and his or her creativity can sometimes innovate something really important. When important innovation happens, that person needs protection from the idea of being stolen. In my experience, it is far more likely that a small company will benefit from the existence of software patents than it will happen that the entrepreneur is crushed by a large company claiming that the small guy has infringed on their patents. My third reason for continuing to award software patents is a consequence of the protections that I've just described. Innovative small companies often want to partner with large companies to grow their business. It's simply the way it happens. The protections provided by software patents provide a level of comfort that the large company won't just steal the small company's ideas. Moreover, patents are helpful to the large company considering a partnership with a small company because they clearly identify the areas where they might be violating the smaller company's patented technology. Consequently, software patents enable commerce and provide opportunities for small companies to grow. Some have argued that software copyright protections are all that software developers need to protect their ideas. It is true that every company where I've worked, we have placed a copyright notice at the start of every source code file that we've used to create our software. Certainly our copyrights would be infringed if the files were plagiarized and used to make competitive products. To pre prevent this from happening, we treat our source code as precious trade secrets and prevent other people from seeing them. 
since we never share our source code, others are not able to build upon our work. Copyright protection is not broad enough to protect what is the essence of the software innovator's invention, which is often simply the fact that what their software has done is even possible. Only patents can do that. By accepting patent protections, software innovators like myself and other patent holders trade temporary protection of their inventions for the requirement that a full description of those inventions be placed in the public record so that others can build upon our work. I'm not going to argue that all software patents are deserved. And like others in the software industry and outside of it, I am concerned when non-practicing entities can make frivolous patent infringement claims knowing that there is no possibility of counter-assertion claims. But the solution to these important issues has to be something other than to stop issuing software patents. To sum up, software is not inherently less patentable than hardware or process, since it generally takes less capital to start a software company than one that makes hardware widgets, there are more opportunity for software innovation. The purpose of patents is to foster innovation and force public disclosure so that others can build upon it, which is what it does. One shouldn't throw out software patents because they are sometimes providing an opportunity for trolls or because anger about a few controversial lawsuits regarding look and feel. Thank you very much. So good morning. My name is Tom Lang. I am the Director of Modeling and Simulation at Procter & Gamble. And thank you to the BSA and NAM for um, this opportunity to speak. On behalf of manufacturers, those of us who make things, um, and, and let me start with my company, where I've worked for for 34 years uh, after graduating with a chemical engineering degree. Now, P&G is well known, uh, it's a well known brand to investors, right? So we're one of the Dow 30. We're celebrating our 175th anniversary. We were uh, founded on the banks of the Ohio River in Cincinnati by a soap maker and a candle maker who married sisters. Um, <laughs> And there were a lot of pigs in Cincinnati, so we, they had a common source of raw material. Um, now, as an investor brand, we've paid our investors um, dividends without interruption since 1890. We've um, consecutively increased those dividends every year since, you know, for the last 56 years. We've returned uh, $88 billion to our investors in the last 10. Now, that's as an investor brand. But I would hope that most of you would know Procter & Gamble by our brands that we sell in the stores. Um, we make brands, and 90% and of US households have at least one. Um, hopefully, you would know Pampers or Tide, Crest, um, Pantene, Head & Shoulders, Gillette, Charmin, Downey. Ime's Dog Food, uh, Olay, Oil of Olay, Bounty, Towels. So these are, these are our brands. We try to make everyday life a little better. You know, we're not curing cancer. We're not providing for the national defense. Um, and so it may not seem that those products, you know, how can, tar you know, how, how can toilet paper be innovation, right? Um, and so it may not seem like that, but I can tell you that innovation is our lifeblood and the key to our longevity and success. We hold over 30,000 patents. We get several thousand a year, some of which are in uh, software and in my area of modeling and simulation. Now, as a bit of a side, so why does my job even exist? What, what does a director of modeling and simulation do? You know, no, I do not run an agency of models. Um, 
No, I don't do video games <laughs> and simulation. Uh, both, you know, admirable duties. I'm in a much more boring business. Um, modeling and simulation replaces the slow and expensive learning and experiments that are mostly done physically with virtual simulations. In other words, my job is to figure out whether something's going to fit, whether it's going to work, whether it's going to be safe, make financial sense before it ever exists in the real world. That's what I do. Um, coolest job in the world, by the way. Um, so what, what, what's hard about those products that I talked about? Uh, so I'm going to sum it up as in, in a couple of words or a, a couple major uh, areas. Contradictions and scale. So let's talk about contradictions. So let's take laundry detergent, for example. One of the contradictions it has to solve is to remove a stain but protect the fabric. I can turn, I can remove any stain any of you guys have on your shirts tomorrow. It'll also turn your shirt white, <laughs> right? So that's not the plan, right? We want to take a stain out <laughs> and leave, leave the colors. Now that can be particularly challenging when it's ink and something that is supposed to be permanent. So we can't solve all problems. But, but the idea of we're trying to remove a stain and protect a fabric. Here's another one. We want something to dispense easily, but stay put or applied. Now that's fancy words, but what we mean is you want to be able to squirt toothpaste out of the tube without needing some caulking gun. And we want to be able to have it not fall off the brush before you get it to your mouth, right? Now it turns out to do that is not as trivial as it sounds. Because you want, you know, in the world of science, we call that um, non-Newtonian fluid. We want something that when it's moving, it moves quickly, and when it stops, it stays put. The same is true for oil of Olay. You're not going to want to, you know, if you squirt something out of the tube and it runs off the wrist, there's not many people that are going to think that's a good thing. And yet, if it's so hard to get out of the tube or out of the bottle, that's not good either. We also want something to be strong but soft, even when it's wet. So think about that. We have a paper towel that, when it gets wet, is still strong. So it's something made out of paper. We most often judge paper as something that comes apart when it gets wet, which, by the way, is a contradiction that's extremely important for Charmin. We want it to come apart when it's wet, but we want it to be strong when it's used, right? So these contradictions make make this innovation problem much harder than you think. The other challenge we have is affordability, right? We want something to be affordable so that it can be used every day. Um, now, a lot of industries are high tech, right? Satellites, jet aircraft, um, cars, um, defense, right? And we call those industries high tech and they're full of scientists and engineers. Uh, you can imagine my challenge when I go to a fine, reputable US institution and I try to recruit an engineer and I've got a satellite maker on one side and I'm saying, hey, Charmin is the thing to do. <laughs> now it turns out our manufacturing is much more complicated than you think. I know a guy who makes toilet paper who has 200 US patents. Right? Now, why would that be? Because of what I was talking about, the contradictions, but also the speed. Something as simple as putting a perforation, right, so that you can tear off the paper. I want it to tear at the perf, not, you know, come rolling off in some jagged way. So we make toilet paper at highway speeds in something wider than this table, and I have to put a perforation every six inches. 24-7, 365 on every machine I make. That's actually harder to do than you think. In, in other words, um, a, a diaper, a disposable diaper Pampers, has 30 different, ingre 30 different materials, glue beads, assembly operations. Everything 
comes from a spool, is never touched by a human hand, and is manufactured in 100 milliseconds. So when you're making something that fast, right, you need software, you need instrumentation, and you need design and analysis capability just to make it. So, so why am I here talking about software today? It, it turns out that, you know, innovation is our lifeblood behind every, as many of these have indicated, every one of those innovations. There is software in how we manufacture the product, and there's software in how we design and analyze that software, or that particular innovation. Whether a Tide bottle will break when you drop it, right? That last year, we did over 150,000 calculations of whether bottles, plastic bottles, will be strong enough, right? Now, what's the challenge there? Well, the challenge is I don't want to put any more plastic in a bottle than is absolutely necessary. Right? Because A, one, it costs and is expensive. B, we don't want it necessarily in our landfills. Right? But if, the, if I make that bottle a little thin, if I don't really pay attention to the design, and someone drops it on aisle six in Walmart, I promise you, Walmart will be probably more unhappy than you will. Right? So, so we want a bottle to drop and not break but we don't want to have any more plastic in it than is necessary. So in the end, uh, we patent software, and it embodies our uh, innovations in many cases. Uh, and patent protection is important even to those of us who make lowly production products every day. So with that, I'll end my remarks and turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to give a hand to our panel and thank them. <laughs> for beginning to explain how the, the importance of software patenting to each of their companies. I have a couple of questions here before I open it up to the media and to the folks who work here in the, on the Hill. Uh, and my first question is kind of related to what happened last week. Uh, the President of the United States basically said that the America Invents Act was an important move forward, but it only went about halfway, uh, which indicates that uh, he believes there is more legislation needing. And we recognize that there is a bit of patent legislative fatigue on the Hill from moving forward with, with the bill as it is. But what I'd like to know is what pieces of legislation do you think are necessary to move at this time, and what would be going too far? And I'd like to start with Ms. Daly and just work down the, the panel, please. I, I, I think you were going to find some commonality uh, amongst us in terms of what we think we, we can accomplish reasonably uh, within a reasonable time frame. Um, the first of those really is ownership transparency, so that we really understand who the real party and in interest is, who the owner is of, uh, of the patents. Um, we really don't have that now, and I think we would all agree that having that kind of transparency um, will give us a better ability to um, undertake the licensing activities that hopefully can replace many of the litigation activities that occur now. So I think that's, a, uh, that's an important uh, uh, proposition that the uh, PTO has put forward and I think that we all uh, support that. Um, uh, there's also, I believe, um, a bill that's been reintroduced relating to uh, loser pays in patent litigation. Um, that's something that we, Oracle, has supported. Um, I think the bill has been changed somewhat, and I haven't had an opportunity to, to read it, but I, I don't expect it to be uh, so changed that it's not something that we would continue to support. Um, these are two, just two, uh, initiatives uh, sort of narrowly drawn. Um, we're not talking about something that's really big and comprehensive, but something that's very, very specific, narrowly drawn that, uh, that we think can actually achieve a great deal. So I've, I'll focus on those, and I'll let others speak about some, some others. Well, I would certainly echo what Dorian just said. I think that there would be uh, you know, real value in having a legislative approach um, to the awarding of attorney's fees and the adoption of uh, a, a loser pays rule. 
Uh, I think that uh, something like transparency can be advanced legislatively as well. It might be possible to advance it through uh, executive branch decision making also, but it's certainly ripe for legislative consideration. I also agree that, especially after six years of hard and important work that was just completed only a year and a half ago, um, it would be most appropriate to have something that is uh, focused, that is more narrow, and that can move forward more quickly, that recognizes that other steps need to be taken by other uh, actors in the system in both the public and private sector. And I'd also say, to answer your question, what would be going too far? Uh, I think that it would probably be a step backwards if the Congress were to try legislatively to uh, redefine the standards for patentability um, or to try to take certain categories of invention uh, and uh, change the rules for them uh, or to exclude them from patentability. Uh, I think that we have uh, an incredibly valuable unitary system and I think we have a set of legislative standards that best evolve through judicial consideration on a fact-by-fact -fact and case-by-case -case basis. I think that oftentimes the courts have a scalpel and the Congress needs to think about a meat cleaver just because of the differences between fact-by-fact -fact deliberations and legislation. And each tool is important but they need to be applied to the right set of problems. My point of view is we've just begun implementing the America Invents Act, which was the most significant U.S. patent reform in our lifetime. Passage of that legislation required, as many of you know, years of hard-fought negotiation and compromise amongst many patent system constituents. It was really bipartisan, cross-industry accomplishment. We need to be patient and let these changes and those changes made by the courts take effect. IBM has been actively participating in the Patent Office's recent efforts to gather more accurate and complete ownership information. This is a change that we will support. This information is necessary to enable efficient licensing, assess freedom to operate, and invest intelligently in research and development. The Patent Office also needs this information to examine applications and conduct effective post-grant reviews. We're looking forward to the Patent Office's proposal for new rules to obtain better ownership information. I have little to uh, offer beyond what uh, the other panelists have said. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, we would support very much as uh, training and more resources to the U.S. PTO to, uh, to do the analysis of the software patents so that they're able to get information, uh, not, uh, not uh, just other patent applications, but uh, through uh, other databases on uh, prior art and, uh, and information that will help them understand the nuances of the novelty of the uh, patents that were actually applications that we're providing. Uh, I also have little to offer. I would only echo that I think this you know, building skills in the examiners to better understand software um, as, as something that needs to be patented, but it has its special uh, needs in terms of how it's evaluated. Um, Robert, let me also say, since I'm a, uh, I'm a litigator at heart, I grew up as a, as a litigator, so um, I can't um, not bring up some targeted litigation reforms that I think um, would be useful in, in addition to the loser pays legislation. Uh, one of those would be the discovery uh, cost shifting, because as you are aware, all of the burden is on uh, one party and not the other. There's no opportunity to assert uh, a, um, a counterclaim when you're dealing with an NPE. Uh, and so the discovery burden is uh, quite huge. Uh, in one of the cases that I currently have, the patent uh, holder is accusing virtually my entire product portfolio. And so what that means is that they will seek discovery on, abs on the engineering process for absolutely every product that, uh, that we create. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge burden. Uh, the other is strengthening the AIA's joinder provision. 
Um, it was a welcome provision, but we've seen in the Lexmark case in Texas that some courts are taking a creative approach to, to getting around that. And, and uh, while severing uh, uh, defendants, uh, then reconsolidating them all in that particular court uh, for all purposes, discovery through the Markman, uh, even though Markman wouldn't necessarily be um, binding on another, uh, on another court because um, the, many of these uh, defendants would be able to transfer to uh, another jurisdiction. So something to sort of fill the gap there uh, that uh, some, um, some judges have been able to find, I think something like that would be appropriate. That sounds great. Uh, while I've got this uh, wealth of information sitting next to me at this <laughs> table, I'd like to ask something about what I hear anecdotally uh, in my practice now, which is about the, the quality of software patent. You guys have firsthand experience with this. So I would like to know whether you're seeing consistent problems with software patents, being that they are not either properly searched, meaning references are missing, they are uh, overly broad, claiming more than they really have the right to, or they are unclear if those are the problems, uh, if they're consistent across the board, if there's one area that the PTO needs to be focusing upon, and if, uh, if, if, if you're seeing a larger or smaller proportion of those coming out, are, are most of the patents now that are coming out from the Patent and Trademark Office with its new initiatives on quality better than they were before, or worse than they were before, so it's a compound question. And at the end, I'd like to know whether you're filing more software patents this year than last year, and why. Well, uh, say a couple things. First, I, I think the quality of uh, patents relating to software issued by the PTO uh, are definitely improving. Um, I also think there's opportunities for continued improvement. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that whenever you have a new technological field, a certain set of challenges are basically inherent uh, in the nature of patent examinations, and things need to be done to address them. Uh, first, having an adequate uh, supply or library of prior art is critical. The PTO has been investing in that, and I think there's been good progress, and it, it's something to stay attuned to. Uh, I think that the uh, the, the potential uh, breadth or overly broad uh, claims that sometimes get filed uh, can be a problem. I think it's important for examiners to be able to actually have the time and take the time to compare the claims in patent applications with the invention that actually serves as the basis for those claims. And it's not clear today that examiners necessarily always have sufficient time to do that, and that's something that is important for the PTO to address, and frankly, I think it's something that's important for Congress to be sensitive to when it contemplates the prospect of diversion of funds, especially if we face sequestration. I think that there are definite opportunities for improvement in the way claims are written. I think the PTO is doing a good job of pointing out to all of us that most industries have more standard terms that are in uh, patent applications more commonly than is the case for information technology. Um, I think they're right to nudge us to use standard terms where they exist and to define non-standard terms when we're relying on those instead. So you know, these are all sort of brass tacks um, that nonetheless are important that will continue to improve the, the patent system. Um, to answer your other question, I don't think we're filing more patent applications in 2013 in the United States than we filed in 2012 in the United States. But I will say this, we're filing more patent applications in China in 2013 than we did in 2012 or 2011. And I just think it's important to keep that in mind. It's important to remember, perhaps especially important to remember, that on a week when people are talking about the potential loss of trade secrets, we better take care that we not lose our patents. Because other countries are definitely recognizing the vital role that the patentability of software-related inventions play. And those of us who are global companies are recognizing that, and we need to remember that it's a source of strength for our economy as well. And 
we continue to file patents aggressively, including software patents. Um, the current law and the PTO procedures provide the framework that's necessary to provide full, clear, precise descriptions in the specification and avoid indefiniteness problems. The challenge that we face is rigorous enforcement of those requirements through education of applicants and examiners. The bedrock principle of the patenting system is to provide the public with the boundaries or meets and bounds of what constitutes infringement and to provide examiners with the information they need to examine and ensure patent applications meet all legal requirements for patentability. Let me just say, I, I agree with everything that Brad said and, and Neil as, as well. The problems that you describe, um, they exist. Things are improving. Um, I also agree with what former Director Kapos has said, which is let's give the AIA a chance. It takes a little bit of time, so there are some uh, improvements that we're seeing in the patents that are being issued, uh, and that will continue uh, as, as, we, as we give it a chance. And then as Brad has mentioned, there are other initiatives that the PTO is already talking about that will continue to help that process. So I think we will see um, continued improvements, but it's really important for us to be ever vigilant and not think that the, the work is ever done. Uh, we need to make sure that the, the quality issue is attended to uh, all the time. Uh, we do at Oracle, um, we are uh, filing uh, more patents. It's not really driven by uh, these changes. It's driven by the increase uh, in the um, R&D spend that we have year over year, and that gives us the ability to file more applications. Thank you. Anyone else wish to answer? Well, I, I would just say that from our perspective, uh, patents have been pretty critical to our company, and uh, we are filing about as many patents this year as we have in prior years and in doing a lot of international patent filing as well. Uh, we, we believe that, um, that uh, any uh, reduction in the funding of the USPTO would be a terrible mistake because it's just going to move the cost burden to the courts. And uh, we think it would be, uh, we just want to make sure that, uh, that, the, uh, that the process uh, continues to improve. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, as we are, uh, don't have a lot of time left and I've got a standing room only, I would like to open it up to questions from Hill staffers and members of the press, please. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Someone will bring a microphone to you uh, and we will try to answer your questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes, sir. And please identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, great panel. Thank you all. I'm Mark Caldwell from Senator Jerry Moran's office. Good to see you, Brad. Um, I just have a basic question. If we create a greater transparency mechanism, is there a threat that other countries could potentially use that and file the existing patents? Is there a proof of concept that's necessary? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty basic on this stuff, so I just was curious. I, I would say I, I, don't, I don't think that's likely to be a concern because what we're really talking about is being more transparent with respect to the ownership of patents that have already issued. So the patent uh, you know, itself is already available for inspection. Somebody is listed as the owner of it, um, but it's not always clear who the real owner is if there's been a transfer, for example, and I think this would simply clarify that. And as Neil pointed out, I think that would be a step that would encourage more responsible licensing. I, I, I'm not worried about what the effect would be overseas. It's a good, good point to think about. This is your opportunity to ask some real experts some questions on issues that I think are going to be uh, raised in your offices. So please do not hesitate to ask. Anyone? 
Although keep in mind if those questions come up later uh, in your offices, we're, we're, we're available. So <laughs> we'll answer questions anytime. All right. Um, do you want me to do what? Well, I, I can continue asking questions. I can get more here that they've touched on, but I haven't gone all the way through. I've got some real questions. I'd like to hear from the panelists. Um, why isn't copyright or trade secret enough? What's the differentiation there? Why do you need patent protection? Why is that the important form, uh, something you're unwilling to give up? Yeah, I'd like to start. Um, copyright law protects the specific code in software or embodiment, um, but does not protect the invention itself and the idea. And so it's really not adequate to rely upon copyright protection to protect the inventions that software companies or companies that, that invent and then implement in software uh, create. I'd just say a couple things building on that. First, trade secret protection by definition applies to ideas that are secret. Uh, and in contrast, there's an awful lot that gets invented that needs to be public. We want it to be public. It needs to be uh, in, embodied and implemented in products that, in effect, will make it, it public sometimes. Uh, and one of the strengths of the patent system is it not only encourages, but it, in fact, requires uh, a level of public disclosure in order to get a patent approved. The application needs to be filed. The application will be reviewed by the government. The patent will issue and be publicly available. Um, I think Neil's right to point out the difference between copyright and patents. I think if, it, if there was a time when it was possible to conceive that copyright might be the legal vehicle for protecting certain inventions instead of patents. We sort of tried that, to be honest. There was a, a, a set of thinking in the 1980s. Uh, there were, were cases that went uh, first to the circuit courts, one that went to the Supreme Court, um, that sort of put to the test uh, whether copyright versus patent should be the, the legal vehicle for, in effect, protecting, as, as Bob put it earlier, uh, novel, non-obvious uh, inventions. And, and what the courts basically included, concluded was that the patent system was better suited uh, for addressing this. Uh, it was better suited for uh, uh, testing the novelty uh, and, and utility and non-obviousness uh, of these kinds of inventions. The standard is different from what's in, in copyright law. Um, it was better to have examiners in a position to focus on, on these types of things. Uh, and so the courts, the Congress, the country, and then the world uh, basically uh, made a decision to, to pursue the patent path. Uh, I would say despite the challenges that the path has sometimes uh, involved, um, looking back, I think it was the, the right path to take. Uh, it's the path we're on. It's too late to go back and choose a different path, I, I think, to be honest. And what we really uh, need to do is continue to perfect that path going forward. Um, that, that being said, it's, it's clear in the amendments to the Copyright Act and in, and in uh, numerous cases that uh, software is uh, protectable under the Copyright Act, uh, and so many of us do use that as one of our lines of, of defense to protect our intellectual property. Uh, however, I think it's also fair to say that um, the protectability of, of software under the Copyright Act is also under some assault. Uh, just as we have this discussion with respect to patents, I think there is a debate about whether or not all software uh, should be uh, copyrightable. And um, being on the receiving end of a, an adverse decision uh, from a federal court about certain software um, deemed not copyrightable, uh, I'm particularly sensitive to that. Uh, and there was suggestion in the decision itself that perhaps the better vehicle was patents and, and not copyrights. Uh, and so I think it does raise a question that there are some who are advocating for fewer protections for software under the Copyright Act. So, if you've got some arguing fewer protections under copyright, fewer protections under patent, uh, you can see that it makes uh, those of us that are in the technology sector and those of us that are in consumer product goods, other sectors that rely on software, it makes, that, it makes us very, very nervous about the future of our um, investments and innovation. I think I got time for one last question that I would like to ask based upon 
things that I've read, which was that the, the life cycle of software is uh, significantly different and less than that of other industries, for example, pharmaceuticals. Um, and maybe uh, we should be considering uh, a shortened term for software uh, because it's not useful uh, after maybe five years. Um, uh, is there uh, comments that the, the that the panelists would like to make? Uh, does does the software that's out there block uh, research into new software? Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about what I'm sure you've also read. Well, I, as Brad had mentioned before. Um, Software is different from lots of other things, uh, and uh, so you can't uh, you you can't just rely on those comparisons. The fact of the matter is, software, I mean, is useful beyond five years. Uh, we have many customers who are using their software for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. We're continuously upgrading it and updating it and trying to make improvements. Uh, but I don't think that is a particularly valid argument. If you go to some of these, uh, some of these companies that uh, use their software and their mission-critical systems, uh, they will tell you that it's very useful far more than five years. There's only one thing that drives me absolutely crazy when I come to Washington, D.C., and that's when I walk into congressional offices and I see computers that are running Windows XP. <laughs> I hear people say, you know, this product is not as innovative as Apple's software on the iPad. And I point out, do you realize we created Windows XP 12 years ago? I guess it is more useful than just five years worth. At least you all seem to be using it for more than five years. Uh, and I just think it, it just goes to point out, you know, some th sometimes things have a shorter lifespan. Sometimes they have a longer lifespan. I think that if one were to try to get into the business of adapting the term of patents for different technologies in each field, you would just in, in find yourself in an impossible task because of this you know, enormous variation even within a single technological field and variation over time. The, the truth is we actually have something that works pretty darn well. Yeah, I, I couldn't disagree more with the idea of uh, shortening the life of a software patent. Um, I think that in some senses this question is confusing specific implementations of software with what's really the um, innovation that's sometimes embodied in software. Uh, as I said earlier, the idea that some specific task can absolutely be done. And to the degree to which your software is a uh, lower level that you are a platform rather than perhaps a specific application that people are going to be using, uh, then the lifetime almost certainly is going to be longer. So I don't think people who are making uh, games for Android or iPhones are going to be patenting their, applic their applications very often. And they do, in fact, have a short life. But for people like us who are making systems that your software are going to be running on top of, uh, you're going to be using it for decades. Well, thank my panel very much. I'm really pleased with the discussion. <laughs> and thanks for your time and attendance and listening to the issues related to this extremely important issue to, to all of the United States. Thank you.